The Academy Awards are being held in Los Angeles Sunday. Oppenheimer is getting much of the buzz, but there's also excitement surrounding a film called The Zone of Interest, with its remarkable soundscape evoking the worst of the Holocaust. Special correspondent Malcolm Brabant visited Oscar-nominated sound designer Johnny Byrne at his studio as part of our arts and culture series, Canvas. At an art cinema in southern England, 5,500 miles from Hollywood, the audience is preparing to be assailed by the sonic genius of Johnny Byrne. I can't say I hope you enjoy it, because that might not be the right word, but um, I hope you appreciate it. That's it, it's tomorrow from Lager. Zone of Interest chronicles the mundane existence of a Nazi family living next to Auschwitz, while more than a million people are being murdered just over the garden wall. For his depiction of the banality of evil, director Jonathan Glazer has earned multiple Oscar nominations. Jonathan Glazer is very clever. He draws upon the collective knowledge that we all have of that period of time in history to paint pictures in your head. And while the genocide of Auschwitz is ever present, the audience never casts eyes on it. I think sound is an extraordinary phenomenon. For me, I believe that we react to it. Immediately that you hear something, your subconscious and, and your primal brain starts appending history and artifacts and nouns to that in a way that with visual images, you process it. With sound, you react to it. This garden was a haven for the man in the white suit. Rudolf Huss, on the right, was the commandant of Auschwitz. Huss was captured after the war and executed in Auschwitz in 1947, not far from this backyard. They would walk people into the gas chamber and, and they believed they were going for a shower, but obviously they were not, and, and that would create quite a noise. Johnny Byrne worked his alchemy at home to the alarm of his family. I've worked on many films in that back room and some with loud yeah. grisly monsters and all sorts and it's never a problem but for this I had to buy a soundproof door because it really is the most violent film I've ever worked on and yet you don't see any violence. In your drive to be authentic, how important was it for you at the same time to respect the sanctity of Auschwitz and also to honour the memory of the people who died there? I knew there was great responsibility not only to make the film work through sound but, but to make sure that what the sound we were using was historically accurate and as faithful as possible to the atrocities that happened there without going to the point of sensationalising. In this scene, it's the, the wife of the commandant and her mother's come to visit. There's obviously all the sound that's in the garden, but the sound that's telling the other story is what you're hearing from the other side of the wall. What it actually is is a collection of sounds that I've recorded over a period of a year of, of finding things from research that represent what happened there. Heavy industry, soldiers marching, the echo of the orchestra that played inside Auschwitz. And riots in Paris. I wanted to go out into the world and find where screaming actually exists. And given the context of, you know, what you're watching and in the film, placing those sounds in the background very quietly is an awful lot more convincing than having a sort of actor recreate it. Talk us through what's happening here. So this is the, the boys in their bedroom at night. Um, the elder boy is up on his top bunk looking at some teeth. Gold teeth. Gold teeth. Extracted from corpses in the gas chamber before they were incinerated. There's a particular sound here that the boy hears. It's a rhythm of his daily life. The suggestion? That is the sound of the furnaces working overtime to eviscerate evidence of the Nazis' crimes. I made something here with my fireplace and some tubes to fan the flames in a microphone, and I layered that up to, to become a thicker, bigger sound. Which provides the backdrop to one of the movie's most powerful scenes. It's the end of the day, and he's in his garden having a cigarette. This is the, the sound of 
um, you know, what happened at Auschwitz. This is, I think, just over the garden wall, the crematoria and, and the gas chamber. Bern had to track down a vintage Nazi motorcycle to add one key detail. They used to run motorbikes at Auschwitz in order to preserve the sanity of, of the guards, can you believe? Well, to drown out the screams. Absolutely, yeah. As award season reaches its zenith, the accolades keep coming. The BAFTA goes to the zone of interest. Any Bern can win. Good evening. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny to be standing here. My, my mother wouldn't have understood this. She, she always said to me, what do you mean you do the sound on films? They sound all right to me. <laughs> and I, I explained her. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Johnny Byrne and his sound team may have won Britain's highest film award, but the Oscars are a much tougher prospect. As always, there's a very strong field, but it appears that Zone of Interest's main competitor is Oppenheimer, the film about the father of the atomic bomb. I've had it said to me by many of my, you know, uh, very illustrious peers that, that what you've made here is one of the most significant pieces of sound design cinema, you know, ever, potentially. So, um, so great, and, and that's Jonathan Glazer's vision, really, more than anything else. Byrne only has two days to wait to discover whether the Academy feels the same way. For the PBS News Hour, I'm Alkin Brabant in Brighton.